Hi, uh, welcome to ovarian cancer and tuber targeted fluorescent dye. Um, we are going to wait just a couple minutes for people to join in, um, and then we'll start the presentation. So for folks that are just joining in, um, welcome to ovarian cancer and tuber targeted fluorescent dye. We're just going to wait one more minute for folks that are signing in, and that takes a little bit of time. Thanks for your patience. Do you, um, can I ask you a question? Sure, we're broadcasting now, but do you can, uh, Hello? oh my gosh, he turned his volume down on the speakers. Oh, I've turned it down, okay. Can I ask a question? Sure, we started broadcasting. Oh, yeah, uh, okay. Just so you know. I just, okay, we'll just, uh, I'll not ask it yet then. <laughs> Okie doke. Well, I think we're ready to get started. We gave people a couple minutes to sign in. Um, so welcome to Ovarian Cancer and Tuber Targeted Fluorescent Dye. I'm Stephanie Blaufarb, Ovarian Cancer Program Director at SHARE. Um, before the presentation begins, I'd like to tell you a little bit about SHARE. SHARE is a nonprofit organization that has been helping people through breast and ovarian cancer for the last 42 years by offering the support of those who have been there. SHARE offers many services, including a helpline, telephone and in-person support groups, and educational programs, and many of these are specifically for those living with ovarian cancer. All of our services are free of charge. Free of charge. <laughs> so for more information, visit our website at sharecancersupport.org. All participants will be muted during the presentation. When the presenter finishes speaking, we will open up for a question and answer session. You're welcome to submit questions during the presentation through the question pane in the control panel on your screen. When asking questions, remember the presenter is unable to give specific medical advice, so please keep your questions general in nature. This webinar is being recorded and will be available on the SHARE website soon. Now to introduce our presenter, Dr. Philip Lau is the Ralph C. Corley Distinguished Professor of Chemistry and the Director of the Purdue Center for Drug Discovery. Dr. Lau has spent over 14 years in drug delivery research and is the founder and director of Endocyte, OnTarget, HQ Lau, and Novastio. He has published more than 420 scientific articles and has more than 70 active or pending U.S. patents. Nine of these patented drugs stemming from his research are undergoing human clinical trials. His research areas are very diverse. In the last 40 years, he has worked on projects involving plant cells, erythrocytes, immunotherapy, and cancer research. Welcome, Dr. Lau. Thank you. Uh, let me begin by thanking Cher for the opportunity to uh, explain some of the exciting new developments we've been pursuing in ovarian cancer research. and. Uh, I think with SHARE, we share the objective of trying to reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with this uh, very serious disease. And I guess as a matter of introduction, let me just um, explain that uh, there have been a number of studies demonstrating that the more cancer that is removed during surgery, the better the outcome for the ovarian cancer patient will be. One study by a group at Johns Hopkins, headed up by uh, Robert Bristow, uh, the group showed that when um, they compared the survival of, patient, of ovarian cancer patients where the surgeon removed much of the disease but allowed uh, some residual disease to remain behind with the un 
assumption that the chemotherapy following surgery would eliminate the residual disease when this group's survival was compared with another group where um, uh, most of the patients, 75% or more, uh, ex uh, underwent maximal cytoreduction surgery, as they call it, where they, the surgeon tried to remove all the malignant disease that he or she could see with uh, using standard methods. The, the difference in survival in the maximal cytoreduction group versus the minimal one was uh, a, a 50%, which is an enormous difference. Um, these uh, statistics argue that it will be beneficial to try to remove more cancer uh, you know, whenever possible. And so with that objective in mind, we've undertaken to find ways to help the surgeon see more of the malignant disease during, this, during the operation. And uh, this uh, first slide here uh, shows our overall strategy. We uh, take a targeting ligand that is illustrated by the yellow uh, oval at the, uh, in the diagram here. And this is a targeting ligand that is designed to home in on only cancer cells. And we attach to this heart uh, targeting ligand um, some cargo that we wish to carry to the cancer cell. Now, for the case of this particular presentation, the cargo will be a bright fluorescent dye that when it concentrates in the cancer cell will cause the cancer cell to light up and glow brightly, allowing the adjacent healthy cells to remain unfluorescent and there, thereby the cancer, the cancer surgeon, when he, perform, he or she performs the cancer surgery, will be able to see the malignant lesions and distinguish them from the adjacent healthy tissue. And so um, we designed different targeting ligands, as they're called, or these homing molecules for different types of cancer. And one of those that we actually designed for um, um, ovarian cancer is a ligand that binds to a protein called the folate receptor. And the folate receptor, I'll, I'll just skip to this slide, uh, the third slide. The folate receptor is a receptor that's responsible for taking in the vitamin folic acid. Um, you see, you've seen folic acid listed as one of the vitamins on your Wheaties boxes or your cereals and other uh, things that you uh, buy at the store. And it is a very important vitamin because it's required for the synthesis of DNA. And rapidly dividing cells like cancer cells need to uh, make a lot of DNA because each time they divide, they need to reproduce or replicate the DNA in their cell. So they have an enormous appetite for folic acid. Without the folic acid, they couldn't divide rapidly. And uh, your body has three different pathways for taking in this vitamin. On the left-hand side of this uh, picture is shown two of the uh, pathways. One is called the reduced folate carrier, and the second one is called the folate coupled uh, the proton-coupled folate transporter. These two pathways uh, will transport the vitamin folic acid and similar looking or related folate uh, vitamins, but it won't transport into a cell any folate-linked drug. And so cells that use either of these two pathways on the left to supply their folate needs will not be able to take in a folate-linked drug. On the right, uh, is uh, the third pathway for taking in uh, folic acid, the vitamin. And this one is uh, takes the drug in by a, a process called receptor-mediated endocytosis. And I'll show you this on the next slide. But the distinction here, are, there are two distinctions here that are important for you to understand for the rest of the seminar. One is that the folate receptor on the right will take in the vitamin even after it has been linked to a bright fluorescent dye or a, or a therapeutic drug or virtually any cargo we want. And so we can fool the cancer cell into taking in folic acid or taking in a drug when it thinks it's taking in the vitamin. And so if we attach a vitamin, the, the a drug or the fluorescent dye to the vitamin, the cancer cell thinks it's eating the um, the vitamin and it takes in the uh, attached drug, much like a Trojan horse. Now it turns out the second thing you need to remember is that almost all cells in the body rely on one of the two pathways on the left for supplying 
their folate needs, whereas almost all malignant cells rely on the pathway on the right, or many, really, many, many malignant cells do. And so by attaching a drug to folic acid, we can, in fact, uh, deliver it fairly selectively to malignant cells. Now, this next video here shows uh, just a picture of the vitamin folate linked to uh, a red dye called rhodamine. And you can see that little blob entering the cell. This is a picture of a cell. And you can see the cell membrane that we're just showing the video over and over again. That blob entering the cell is probably about 10,000 folate molecules linked to rhodamine, all entering the cell via receptor-mediated endocytosis and entering an endosome. This is how our folate-linked fluorescent dyes enter cancer cells. Um, now, the, the next question before we get to some actual clinical data that, that is probably passing through your minds is uh, what cells express this receptor uh, that carries the attached uh, cargo into the, into the cell by receptor-mediated endocytosis, as I showed you in the last, cart in the last video. And there are actually uh, three different cell types uh, that have this receptor. The first cell type is a variety of cancers, especially ovarian cancer, lung cancer, breast cancer, kidney cancer, brain cancer, colon cancer, and a, a variety of hematopoietic cancers like acute myelogenous leukemia or AML and chronic myelogenous leukemia or CML. So there are other cancers in addition to these that overexpress this folate receptor. A second group of cells that overexpresses a folate receptor are activated macrophages or activated monocytes. You don't need to know the names of these cells. What you need to remember is that they're only present at sites of infection or inflammation. And except if you don't have any inflammatory or autoimmune disease, then these cells will largely be absent from your body. Uh, they do uh, actually rise and accumulate whenever there's a pathogen to be attacked. Uh, the last uh, cell type that takes in uh, folate and folate-linked drugs are the proximal tubules of the kidneys. They're just a cell, one cell type in the kidneys. And these cells are responsible for keeping you from excreting all of the folic acid in your body. It turns out that the all of the folate in your body would be excreted into the urine within about 15 minutes. Uh, so by halfway through this seminar, you would be folate deficient. And uh, it, without this salvage receptor, the salvage receptor captures uh, folic acid from the urine and moves it back into the bloodstream. Without, uh, again, without this receptor, we'd all be folate deficient very quickly. Other than these three cell types, the receptor is really not found in a patient. So if you look at this next uh, picture, we have images of uh, different human, uh, human diseases uh, that have been imaged using folate linked to an imaging agent. That is the imaging agent in these cases is a, a radio imaging agent. So it can be imaged using a, uh, a, uh, a SPECT uh, imaging instrument. Uh, and I don't know whether you can see the cursor here, but this is a, on the left is a healthy individual. And uh, in this healthy individual, if you remember that I said there were three cell types where we see folate receptors. One is cancer. The healthy individual has no cancer. The second is activated macrophages. And those are only found at sites of inflammation. This person has no inflammation. The third cell type, as I mentioned, was in the kidneys, and it's in the proximal tubules of the kidneys. And so this person, you can see the kidneys here. Importantly, the kidneys don't keep the um, vitamin folic acid. They actually return it to the blood. So very soon, they'll clear out of these kidneys. This patient here, just to the right of the one on the left, is a patient with ovarian cancer. And you can see the malignant disease spread throughout the peritoneal cavity. It's uh, easily imaged with a folate-linked imaging agent. Uh, this uh, is the image of a, a heart uh, that is plagued by atherosclerosis, and the atherosclerotic plaque is filled with these activated macrophages, and so you can see uh, the, accum the accumulation of the folate-linked imaging agent by these macrophages with folate receptors in the aortic arch here of the heart. 
Down here at the lower, the, the light image at the, in the lower center is a, an, Im an image of a breast cancer patient where the breast cancer has metastasized to the brain and the dark spot on the left-hand side is the metastatic nodule in the brain. And this is a cancer, a breast cancer that has folate receptors. And so we can image that. Over here is an inflammatory disease. Again, it's sarcoidosis. And down here is arthritis. And you can see the uptake in the arthritic lesions. So it, unless you have an autoimmune disease or a cancer, the only place you should see uptake of a folate-linked drug is in the kidneys. Now that allows us to take folic acid, link it to a bright fluorescent dye, inject it into the vein of a patient, let it go wherever it wants to go indiscriminately throughout the body, the only place it should accumulate is in cancer tissue or in um, uh, a lesion that's caused by some inflammatory or autoimmune disease. And because most cancer patients don't simultaneously have an autoimmune disease, and even if they do, it's usually localized and known and, and characterized and known where it's located. So there is a very low chance of confusion of the surgeon of a, a of an, auto, uh, of an inflammatory lesion from a, um, uh, from a cancer lesion. Now, the reason why I put this image up here, this is not a human image. This is an image of a mouse. They, uh, I think most of the rest of the images, in fact, I think all the rest of the images are human until right at the end. But uh, this was actually the first image that we, that was ever taken in any animal uh, using a tumor-targeted fluorescent dye. And this is a mouse with a metastatic lung cancer. In the center, the round object is the heart. On either side are the lungs. And you can see on the, on the right-hand side, the fluorescent image. And all of the fluorescence is located in the lungs. It's a metastatic lung cancer. And you can see right where it is. Now, if you were a surgeon, you would be able to see these malignant lesions. And you would be able to locate the disease and hopefully cut it out. Uh, this next... This next uh, video is actually a video of the first surgery ever performed on Earth using, in humans, using a tumor-targeted uh, fluorescent dye, a ligand-targeted fluorescent dye. Uh, this was performed by Dr. Go Van Dam and his colleagues at the University of Groningen in Holland, uh, and they injected the patient, it's a lady with ovarian cancer, uh, uh, a, a, an hour or two before surgery, and then they proceeded to remove all of the malignant lesions that they could see with the naked eye and by palpation, that is by touch. A lot of cancer uh, uh, lesions feel stiffer or harder than normal tissue. And at this point in the operation, they think they've removed all of the diseased tissue. And you're looking at the patient's omentum. The, the belly's been opened up, the peritoneal cavity's exposed. And then they turn on the fluorescent lamp. And that's seen up in the upper right-hand corner. Those are fluorescent uh, lesions that they're cutting off. Now, because this is the first patient that has ever been examined, they don't know that these fluorescent lesions are necessarily cancer. We're testing the hypothesis. We believe they are. And so they're cutting away to remove each fluorescent lesion and after they cut it off, you can see on the upper right-hand corner in the fluorescence, the technician picks it up and moves on to the uh, next, uh, to the pathologist and hands it to the pathologist next door. And the pathologist tries to determine whether it's cancer or not. This is a later patient. In this particular patient, you can see uh, the bumps that are there on the surface of the, um, of the intestine. Uh, that, uh, and this is also an ovarian cancer patient, and they, we, they turn on and off the fluorescent lamp. And you can see every time they turn on the fluorescent lamp, the malignant lesions light up and the adjacent normal tissue re remains unfluorescent. So with the aid of these kinds of tools, it, uh, it, it is possible for the surgeon to find more malignant disease. Now, I chose this particular video for one purpose. And that is that the malignant disease is easy to see because it actually protrudes from the normal tissue surface. That is not the case with a lot of others. In this particular video, which is also of an ovarian cancer patient, you're looking at the omentum. The malignant disease does not stick out. It doesn't stand out. And so it is very hard to detect. 
As a matter of fact, it is also very small in size. You can see the tip of the forceps. Most of these malignant lesions are in fact no larger than one or at most two millimeters. And so they would easily go undetected without some highlighting agent that would cause them to fluoresce and appear very different from the adjacent normal tissue. So this, is, this omentum is often a, a location where met, uh, ovarian cancer metastasizes. If you lift up the omentum and look under that drape, you see the, uh, some of the intestines and the other uh, components in the viscera. And even there, you see additional malignant lesions that would be very, very hard to identify and resect without the aid of some highlighting agent, such as this tumor-targeted dye. Now, you need to remember, in looking at these, we don't inject it in, into the individual lesions. The dye is injected into a vein in the arm, and it locates naturally to these malignant lesions. So they, it does have a homing capability. You don't need to know ahead of time where the cancer is. You can inject it systemically, and it'll locate to the cancer. Now, um, as, uh, these initial studies were conducted by Go Van Dam and colleagues, and the data were published in Nature Medicine, as you see listed along the bottom. Here's just a comparison be uh, between what the surgeon would view without the aid of the fluorescence and what the surgeon would see with the aid of the fluorescence. You can see how much easier. This is actually a blow up. Some of these lesions are very small. Um, but the result from this initial clinical trial was that five times more malignant lesions were removed following the fluorescence il illumination than were identified beforehand. In all cases, a surgery was performed without the aid of fluorescence, and then they turned on the fluorescent lamp to see what they had missed. And so this uh, indicates that significantly more disease can be found with the aid of the fluorescent dye. And importantly, in this initial trial, all fluorescent masses removed were confirmed by pathology to be, re to be malignant. So uh, in, in fact, it, the fluorescence is very, a very reliable indicator of cancer. Um, another important result was uh, obtained by Alex Varmeyer at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands uh, at, uh, uh, using the same uh, folate link fluorescein dye. And in this folate link fluorescein dye, uh, they wanted to know what size of lesion could be detected with by prior injection of the dye into the patient. And this is again an ovarian cancer patient. And what is interesting is in the center panel, you see up in the upper left hand corner a cluster of five cells. If you look over in the fluorescent image, that cluster of five cells fluoresces. Uh, uh, other studies of this sort suggested to uh, Dr. Varmeyer and his colleagues that um, virtually all cells in, uh, that at least express folate receptor could be identified and imaged uh, using these uh, low molecular weight tumor targeted uh, fluorescent dyes. The limitation was instead of the uh, tumor targeted imaging agent, it was rather the sensitivity of the camera, how small a lesion would the camera detect and allow the surgeon to remove. So that's still an issue that we probably will uh, continue to explore for many years. Um, with this same dye, this folate targeted fluorescein dye, uh, a study was done by Sunil Singhal, and I have to jump, this is the first time we've jumped away from ovarian cancer. This study was done in lung cancer, but it was with the same tumor targeted dye, and um, I think the results would be representative for uh, other cancers too. Uh, what he, at the question that Su Dr. Singhal asked was, um, how accurate uh, is this imaging uh, in the lung, and would it help the pathologist to determine during surgery whether a lesion that was removed was cancer or not? And as most of you probably know, there are many uh, cases where a, a patient has a mass that's growing, uh, and the surgeon uh, goes in and removes it, and it turns out 
not to be malignant. But while the surgeon is still uh, has the patient open, the pathologist has to determine whether it's malignant or not, uh, because the, the surgeon would not want to uh, terminate the surgery and if there was still additional uh, masses in the patient if, or, or lesions in the patient if it were malignant. If it's non-malignant and they're not harming anything, it may not be important to remove them. So uh, they often have to wait for the pathologist to make a diagnosis during the surgery. And so the co comparison was made between the accuracy of the fluorescence and the accuracy of the uh, pathology exam uh, during the surgery. Now I have to qualify what I'm saying by pointing out that the pathologist during the surgery only has about 20, 20 to 30 minutes to make the diagnosis. They don't have time to stain with antibodies and make a very accurate assessment of whether the tissue is cancerous or not. Uh, but at any rate, in this initial study, um, Dr. Singhal found that the fluorescence was correct, 19 out of 19 cases in lung cancer patients, whereas the intraoperative pathologist was correct in only 13 out of 19, suggesting that these tumor-targeted fluorescent dyes may be <clears throat> of some assistance to the pathologist and could greatly accelerate the uh, speed at which he or she could um, tell the, uh, could diagnose the, the, the tissue as either being malignant or non-malignant. Um, now I'm gonna uh, switch gears here a little bit and uh, tell you of a transition that we made. And that is, here we're looking at a, um, piece of the omentum, this is this drape that covers the viscera in a patient and in everyone. And uh, from the outside, uh, the, um, this malignant lesion was, it was not fluorescent, but when the surgeon uh, at uh, Leiden University Medical Center, Alex Farmeyer, when he cut it open, it was brightly fluorescent. This suggested that the um, a lot of the, this fluorescent dye that we were using was not very transparent to tissue, that there could be brightly fluorescent cancer that we didn't see because it was buried uh, underneath normal tissue in any particular uh, uh, tissue. And so it became important to try to find a fluorescent dye that could be seen through uh, uh, significant layers of uh, normal tissue. So to find that, to identify that dye, we did a very simple experiment, and this tells you how simple some science can be. We went to the butcher shop and uh, obtained a piece of uh, pig uh, muscle that was um, uh, a centimeter thick. And we put various dyes underneath that uh, pig muscle, and we looked to see which dyes we could see uh, through the pig muscle. And as you can see, the best one was the one labeled F in the lower right-hand corner, IR800CW. It was very trend. It was e very easy to see it through a centimeter of this uh, tissue. Uh, that told us, and, and this was nothing new to anybody in the field, that these dyes that had uh, light emissions way in the near-infrared end of the spectrum where our eyes cannot see the light, but a detector can, that the, this wavelength of light is much more transparent to tissue than some of the more visible lights, uh, like the red, green, yellow, and, and blue lights that you can see with your naked eye. They just aren't transparent to tissue. So we went ahead, and then this next slide, we made this dye that is shown in the upper right-hand corner, and we linked it to folate. Folate is, is uh, drawn in black, uh, a linker is in blue, and then the green dye is this new near-infrared dye that is extremely bright. We, we targeted, with, targeted it with folic acid so that folate receptor expressing tumors would take it up. And as you, and as you can see in this mouse study, it does beautifully. The dye on the left is the one that I've shown you all of the images of so far in human cancers. It does a beautiful job of picking up cancer as long as it's on the surface. But if the cancer is buried beneath the surface in a lymph node or deep in a normal tissue, this dye in the visible wavelength range 
will not allow you to see it. It just, the light doesn't penetrate the tissue, whereas the one on the right does. As a consequence, we switched to this new dye called OTL38. As you can see in the lower right-hand corner, the old dye was called EC17. We've since, we, we synthesized both of these here in, the, in our lab at Purdue University. Um, and then we went and compared this new dye with other near-infrared dyes, and OTL38 on the left, as you can see, where we injected exactly the same concentration of a folate targeted version of each dye, we found that the OTL38 was uh, brighter than any of the others. And so we took it into the clinic, and uh, these images are the first images of a uh, cancer patient, uh, just uh, of um, some lesions in a cancer patient. These were done again in, at, uh, in the Netherlands by Alex Barmeyer and his group. And you can see the malignant disease showing up there uh, very nicely. We then, uh, uh, I've got this video, and this video allows you to compare the, this, the, the view of the surgeon without the aid of the fluorescence, that's the lower right, and the view of the surgeon with the aid of the fluorescence. Now, if you look at this tissue, it's very hard, as you can see, to distinguish healthy tissue from malignant tissue. But if you, if you have the aid of the fluorescence, you can see exactly where the malignant tissue is. Now, again, since this was uh, one of the first surgeries, the surgeon uh, wants to feel it because cancer lesions often feel uh, more rigid. They're, they feel harder than adjacent healthy tissue. So he's feeling around because he's not sure whether it's really cancer or not. But again, as we saw with the previous dye, virtually all, it turns out uh, 96% uh, of all the tissue that looks like it for us. This is in fact cancer tissue. And so he was able to cut this out. Uh, in this next uh, video, this is uh, also an ovarian cancer patient. The previous one was ovarian cancer. This one is ovarian cancer. And you can see how diffuse the fluorescence is. When a, when a surgeon sees very diffuse fluorescence, he or she knows that the light is scattered as it's coming out. That means that the malignant lesion is very deep. Between, uh, deep into normal tissue. And so as the fluorescence light is coming out, it's scattered. Here, they found a buried malignant um, um, lymph node that had malignant disease that would have never been found without the aid of this uh, tumor-targeted fluorescent dye. They would have never known that beneath this tissue was a, a cancer. And so that's what they, what, that's another very important value for this. Um, here, this is an image using a different camera. It's the same dye, but the camera represents the cancer with a different fluorescent color. And some surgeons like the uh, purple color, some like the green color better. Um, personally, I think the green color is a little easier to see, but uh, uh, at any rate, uh, doctors Tanya and Singhal at the University of Pennsylvania found this. And what, the reason why they were excited about it was underneath the, uh, um, the rib cage, very hard to find. They would have, they said they would have never seen it because in the absence of the fluorescence, it looks very normal. The tissue looked very normal and they would not have found it without the aid of the fluorescent, uh, tumor targeted fluorescent dye. Um, I just thought I'd mention this uh, same OTL38 is very, has been proven to be very useful in a lot of other cancers. This is an image of an endometrial, uh, cancer lesion uh, there on the right. You can see the fluorescence. It's in a para-aorta lymph node, um, which would have gone undetected otherwise. This video was provided by Dr. Singhal at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. It's a young girl with an osteosarcoma. This is uh, a cancer that metastasizes from the bone marrow to the lungs. And you can see on the right, the lesions in the lungs uh, the one on the left was seen in the CT scan because it's a little bit of a bump. They could see that. The one on the right would have not, not been detected. It's just too much, looks too much like the normal tissue. So hopefully we helped uh, preserve uh, the life of this um, young lady. Um, let me uh, summarize some of what we have found in a clinical, a phase two clinical trial of ovarian cancer patients using OTL38. Uh, we found that the dye showed 98% uh, um, 
should be sensitivity. I'm sorry, I typed that too. This should be 98% sensitivity. That is, um, whenever a lesion is seen in the CT scan, 98% of the time it's fluorescent. So um, the times when it wasn't fluorescent turn out to be, they're, they're easily explained. Sometimes there's some lesions that are very, very, very deep and the light just doesn't make it to them or they are encapsulated in a very dense capsule. And again, in those cases, the light doesn't make it through. Um, it also, we also showed 96% positive predictive value. That is 96% of the time when something fluoresced, it was cancer. The 4% that, uh, when it, that, that fluoresced and were not cancer were actually um, lymph nodes near the malignant cancer, but uh, that contained very abnormal cells, but the pathologist did not identify them as cancer cells. They said that he said that uh, he or she said the lymph, lymph nodes were very abnormal and should be removed, but because they were not actually cancer, we had to count them as a false positive, and so we get the 96% predictive value. They should have been removed anyway. So the uh, results is that the, the phase two data were very, very good. Uh, many undetected tumor lesions were identified uh, in these patients, the lesions, cancer lesions that would have not been found otherwise. Uh, lesions as small as three cancer cells were seen. Uh, the, the depth of the buried, buried lesions uh, could have been up to 20 millimeters deep or two centimeters deep uh, into normal tissues, and they were still able to see these buried cancer lesions. Um, the, uh, the drug was found to be safe and effective. Uh, uh, and in phase three, uh, the phase three protocol, which is undergoing, which is in the process right now, this is the last stage of FDA required approval. Uh, it uh, was approved in one week. That's almost a record time. I've never heard of a, of a trial being approved so rapidly by the FDA, but they were very anxious to move this forward. And it was awarded by the FDA fast track status and, orphan, and was given orphan drug designation. So just in the final few minutes of my talk, I'd like to summarize what we're doing about ovarian cancers that do not express a folate receptor. And what about other cancers, lung cancers, brain cancers, heart, you know, um, liver cancers, esophageal cancers, and so forth, skin cancers that don't express a folate receptor. Some do, some don't in all of those cases. Uh, we have decided to, go, to look at some different tumor markers to see which ones, when added together, would give us the greatest uh, coverage of all cancers. And this is just, I picked endometrial because I figured people were, might be interested, if they're, you're interested in ovarian cancer, you might also be interested in endometrial cancer. This um, graph here shows in blue the uh, percent of the endometrial cancers that express a folate receptor, a large fraction of them do, as you can see by the blue. In the red, it shows the ones that express something called prostate-specific membrane antigen. It's actually also found on the blood vessel walls of most solid tumors, so most of these show some red. What was interesting to us was that the green, is, which uh, is the patient samples that express something called carbonic anhydrase 9, and none of the normal samples expressed any of it, yet most of the malignant samples expressed some. So we decided to look into this further to see if it might serve as another tumor marker. And uh, so we looked at a large number of cancers and measured the level of carbonic anhydrase 9 gene expression in the uh, normal tissue versus the malignant tissue. The normal tissue is a solid bar, so on the far left is normal cervix. The bar to the, just to the right of it is the level of carbonic anhydrase 9 expression in cervical carcinoma. Number We looked at a large number of samples in each case here. Next one is a normal esophagus, esophageal cancer, normal pancreas, pancreas pancreatic cancer, cancer, normal kidney, kidney cancer, and so on and so forth. The only normal tissues that expressed appreciable levels of carbonic anhydrase 9 were the stomach and the testes, and surgeons won't have any problem distinguish stomach and intestines from cancer. So this looked like a very good candidate, so we proceeded and made and the 
first thing we did was we looked to see how much was expressed as a function of the size of the tumor. And because carbonic anhydrase 9 is induced by hypoxia, and because tumors become increasingly hypoxic as they get bigger, we found that as the tumor grew to larger and larger sizes, it expressed higher and higher levels relative to the level of a, 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 of a, of a standard uh, standardized uh, gene, uh, glyceraldehyde-3-phosphate dehydrogenase gap DH gene, that this really increased enormously as the tumors became more hypoxic and larger. So we went ahead and built a dye that targeted very specifically to carbonic anhydrase 9, tested it in mice, as you see in this image here. The tumors implanted in the mice take it up. And the nice thing about this particular um, targeted dye is it, it, this will allow us to image almost all cancers, because almost all cancers upregulate carbonic anhydrase 9. This just shows uh, some uh, pictures of uh, resected tumors. Um, and it shows that the hypoxic middles or centers of these tumors is where the dye accumulates most. So it allows you really to image those regions of a tumor that are very, very hard to image by uh, most other methods. Um, this uh, shows, uh, in this case, another targeting ligand that we've thought might be useful for ovarian cancer. In fact, I think it will be, is um, this LHRH receptor targeted dye. The LHRH receptor is overexpressed in endometrial cancers, ovarian cancers, breast cancers, and prostate cancers. So it would make a very nice contribution. We don't have the resources yet to develop the, either the either the C carbonic anhydrase 9 targeted fluorescent dye or the LHRH receptor targeted dye, but hopefully uh, in the future we can make that available to patients as, we, as the resources become available. Um, finally, right at the end, I thought I would speculate with you on where this area of uh, fluorescence-guided surgery might be going in the future. And, you know, I may be totally wrong on this. I'm not a surgeon. I'm a, a chemist and a biochemist. So um, my, my uh, anticipation of the change in the field may be, may be inaccurate. But I do believe, first of all, that the um, use of tumor-targeted fluorescent dyes to uh, assist the surgeon interoperatively in finding malignant disease is, going, is here to stay. I think it's really going to revolutionize surgery, uh, cancer surgery. Because other normal tissues can also be accidentally damaged during surgery. Wouldn't it be nice if they were all painted a different color so the surgeon could see them? And so we've begun to do some of this painting of different normal tissues to allow the surgeon to distinguish some of the uh, more susceptible normal tissues from adjacent uh, malignant tissues. This is one of the problems during hysterectomies. I put this in as, as an example because I thought the audience would also be interested in this if you're interested in ovarian cancer. During hysterectomies or during colon cancer surgeries, it's um, a not common event, but it does happen in about up to 2% of the patients that the ureters, a ureter is accidentally cut. And the reason why this happens is the ureters are often buried in normal tissue. As you can see here on the left, where is the ureter? Is it the tube on the far left? It's, I don't know whether you can see the cursor. Is it here? Is it this tube next to it, the gray tube next to it? There's something up in the upper left-hand corner that's different. There's this vascular bed. Where is the ureter? And, how, and if, you're, if you have to remove uh, some cancerous tissue in there, what do you have to avoid cutting to keep from cutting the ureter? And there you can see when you highlight the ureter, it's actually diffuse, very diffuse, but you can see it. It's buried beneath that vascular bed, maybe a centimeter or more deep. But um, this allows the surgeon to know where that ureter is located. If the ureter is severed, then the operation must be extended for uh, quite a significant amount of time to re-suture or re-ligate the ureter back together urine can uh, move from the kidneys to the bladder. Uh, one last um, potential application here is these same tuber-targeted fluorescent dyes 
can be exploited to image any cancer cells in circulation. And we call these circulating tumor cells. And you can see that periodically, um, if you put a, a, a microscope that can detect the fluorescent dyes of this wavelength, you can see cancer cells floating by. And uh, indeed, in some cancer patients, there are a lot of cancer uh, cells in the bloodstream. And in others, there are a few that we feel that eventually this might be developed into a diagnostic technique to see if the cancer surgery has been completely successful, then the patient should have no uh, circulating tumor cells left. On the other hand, if there's residual disease somewhere in the patient, you'd probably still see these. So um, to summarize, um, I told you, I spoke only about the um, uh, folate targeted imaging agents, and then I talked a bit about the carbonic and hydrase 9 targeted one, and then ultimately the LHRH receptor targeted. We have developed other tumor targeted fluorescent dyes and also uh, um, tumor targeted drugs for treatment of the cancers for a variety of cancers. We have now, I think, vert, uh, targeted medicines for almost all of the cancers. They're still in, in animal studies, but eventually we hope to bring them into humans. And here are the conclusions of my talk. I think uh, what, what I've hoped to share with you is that tumor-targeted fluorescent dyes can reveal more malignant lesions than can be detected by current methods. Number two, as more ovarian cancer tissue is removed, patient survival increases. There are a number of articles on this, and we believe that our tools will enable this and improve, and improve patient survival. Uh, tumor targeting or homing ligands can be developed for fluorescence-guided surgery of all cancers. I just talked about three, but we have multiple ones, and they can apply to other cancers as we have the resources to move them into human clinical trials. Uh, circulating tumor cells can be quantitated using tumor-targeted infrared dyes. And uh, I think uh, targeting ligands can also be designed for imaging healthy structures such as the ureters that I showed you um, and the, to help avoid accidental damage to these structures during surgery. It may be important to highlight nerves during prostate cancer surgeries or head and neck cancer surgeries or the bile ducts in other surgeries and so forth. And the final slide then shows the people that have helped me with all of this work. There's been a group at Purdue University uh, in my lab now. I've started this company called On Target Labs, and these three scientists are doing a lot of work out there on this same topic. We've worked with a number of surgeons, and uh, Leslie Randall at UC Irvine, Sean Dowdy at Mayo Clinic in the Netherlands, Go Van Dam at Groningen, Bacillus Zia Christos in Munich, Alex Varmeyer at, at Leiden University Medical Center, and at the University of Pennsylvania, we've uh, worked with uh, Sunil Singhal, Janos Annie, and John Lee. And Sunil Singhal, I should really mention, has been extremely helpful in um, helping guide us in our efforts here. So thank you all for your uh, time, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you very much. So now let's start the Q&A. Um, Are there you any can questions? Still... Oh yeah, can you hear me? Um, can you, Dr. Lau, can you hear me? Oh, okay, I just turned it up. I had it turned down. Were you, you were able to hear me the whole time, right? Yes, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, just to introduce the Q&A, uh, folks that are watching, you can still submit questions uh, by clicking on the question pane on the GoToWebinar software, uh, and you can type in your questions there and submit them, and we will read them off. Um, but first, I had some questions about your uh, clinical trials on this. So you said that a phase two trial was completed, and now there's a phase three that's been approved, and, and or how is that coming on? What's the progress on that? Um, there is a phase three clinical trial. This is the last stage of approval. It's being conducted at a number of sites around the country. And um, it, as I said, it was approved uh, in the shortest amount of time that I've ever seen. I have um, currently uh, eight drugs in human clinical trials. And most of the, for most of them, the approval time was se several months. 
And, yeah, and wow. they, uh, we got it back in a week or five days, actually giving us approval and telling us to move ahead. So it was okay. given fast track status. We're in the middle of, of uh, uh, testing it on patients if there are patients out there. Okay, so this is something that is open. It's an open uh, trial that patients can uh, can apply to enter. Yes, that's correct. And uh, what what sort of patients may be eligible? Is it for newly diagnosed or recurrent, or is there any specific uh, population that the study is targeting there? Well, the phase three is on o ovarian cancer patients. I think uh, there are some exclusion criteria, but they're rather minimal. I think if a patient is going in with ovarian cancer for surgery um, and they, you know, don't have heart problems that would um, risk, you know, um, that they might die during surgery or something of that sort, you want to make sure that the patients are not taking any chances or anything of that sort. But other than that, it's, I think it's pretty open. I don't really manage the... Um, right. The uh, clinical aspects. Um, person were interested, they could go online and look at under on target laboratories and contact them, and they could uh, inform the interested patient in the nearest uh, hospital to them where the study might be uh, taking place. And they're they're at outstanding institutions. They're the best. Okay. In the country. So it's not just for newly diagnosed. It could be for a patient who's going in for a secondary cytoreductive surgery. Right? Yeah. yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, so in your earlier studies in the phase one and two, did you see evidence of uh, progression-free survival uh, changes due to the surgery outcomes? Uh, you know, we're still following that. We um, don't uh, have we don't have a, a statistically significant outcome yet, but uh, we we be able to address uh, announce that sometime in the near future. Uh, I would not be the one that would be allowed to do it. It would have to come from the doctor's office. Right. Um, well, oh yeah, and also I'm just curious of the size of those studies that have done so far, you've done so far. Um, mm -hmm. I know usually phase one and two are smaller. About how many people did you have in those studies? Um, there were uh, 45 evaluable patients in the phase two. I don't okay. recall exactly how many in the phase one. I think uh, you know, some of the patients uh, were enrolled, and it turned out that their uh, masses were benign, and, and none of the and benign masses don't take up our OTL38, the folate targeted near infrared dye. And so, um, um, you know, those patients are not evaluated. They don't participate in the trial. So I think overall, we probably enrolled 70 patients, but 45 were evaluable. And those data that I presented, 98% uh, sensitivity, 96% specificity or positive predictive value uh, all came, came from that for, that set of 45 patients. And that was the data we submitted to the FDA. And um, obviously, on their response, they were quite impressed with the data. Okay. Um, or was there anything for overall survival? I guess that's also something that is uh, you're going to be looking at for your phase three overall and progression-free survival. Actually, uh, we're, this is something we're following in a phase four. Uh, ah, in other words, okay. we follow up on the patients. The the end point for the phase three clinical trial will that, that we have agreed on will be that the to enable the surgeon to find and to, to see more malignant disease than he or she would have otherwise been able to detect. And you know, in many cases, they see a lot more, like many times. That we um, do not specify that the surgeon has to remove it if the surgeon decides that it's in a dangerous location, you know, sitting on, you know, on the aorta or something of this sort. They don't have to remove it. Uh, it's, so the initial approval will be based on the ability to help the surgeon find more disease than he or she would have otherwise found. Phase four, then, we will follow those patients to see if it ultimately improved their overall survival. Okay. Well, we'll look forward to hearing about that. For yeah, sure. we're, we're very interested in that. and We're very anxious to have those data. But I will uh, remind you that there have been five published studies to demonstrate that the more oh. cancer that is resected, the better the survival is of the patient. So we should right. 
we strongly anticipate that the phase four will, will reveal that these patients that have had a lot more disease removed will have lived longer. But we don't know okay. that. Um, and so have patients had any reactions to the dyes, any allergic reactions, any adverse effects at all? Yes, um, a, a small fraction. Um, we're using two different doses of the dye. The doses that we're using are 0 0.0125 milligrams per kilogram, which is very low, meaning that you know an average patient may have one milligram total injected. That's being used in Europe. In the U.S., it's twice that amount, 0 0.025. In the U.S., there have been a, a small subset of patients that have had a minor allergic reaction. This is handled with uh, a Benadryl pill, um, and um, it's, um, there's no other adverse events that really have remarkable. Um, okay. The um, in Europe where they use half the half the dose, apparently they don't they haven't had allergic reactions. Okay, and so that's sort of a short term side effect, not nothing long term, right? Oh yeah, yeah, it's just temporary. It's all, all resolves in a few minutes. I mean, in some cases there'll be. I understand a, 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 a local rash at the site of injection. In other cases, some uh, patients may feel nauseated or something of this sort. Um, but uh, the, pay, the doctors in the U.S., the surgeons in the U.S. now are, uh, in many cases, just preemptively giving the patient a Benadryl beforehand and then they don't see it. I think that's the simplest solution because most people can handle Benadryl and that uh, avoids like, the allergic reaction and that should solve the problem. Okay, great. Um, has is there any uh, possibility for this technology to be used for screening? Yes, that's an excellent question. It, it, this will require a, a second clinical trial, but as you know, um, there are a lot of patients that have the symptoms of, let's say, ovarian cancer, or even that maybe have a, a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation that would predispose them to that, and in which case, uh, it's, it, will, it, will, it will be possible in the future to use a fiber optic and to just go in through kind of almost a pinhole and look around to see if there's any fluorescent lesions inside. And if there are, then of course it would uh, allow for, uh, you know, the patient would be moved into surgery. If not, then uh, no action would be required. That uh, kind of a of a, a diagnosis could be done on an outpatient basis, put a Band-Aid over the spot where the uh, fiber optic was inserted and send the person home. Um, I think that's gonna, um, that, that'll be an application that we look at down the road. I was just speaking with an ovarian cancer surgeon yesterday in Portland, Oregon, and uh, he indicated she would be very interested in and exploring that use of the fluorescent dye. Another one that would be potentially useful is, as I think most of you know, that um, the standard of care right now is for a patient to go in for surgery after uh, debulking surgery. They're usually put on a platinum and a taxane, you know, carboplatinum, um, taxol or something of this sort. And then uh, it's a watch and wait uh, period that begins and uh, you know, the patient, some patients recur, you know, it's, I don't know what, what the percentages are now, but maybe half of the patients recur. And at, uh, the first indication as detected by a rise in CA-125 in the blood uh, is uh, usually happens about 11, 12, 13 months later. It might be possible to identify those that fraction that do recur much earlier. And if you catch it earlier, it's a lot easier to treat. And so maybe a second look, fiber optic uh, diagnostic exam will be uh, something that someone would like to develop uh, with our tumor targeted dye uh, so that you can catch people maybe four months after rather than after you know 12 months later when the disease is already uh, established difficult to eliminate. So it's a very good question. 
Okay, great. That's yeah, that's interesting. Um, what? Maybe you haven't looked at this yet, but what are you uh, expecting as far as costs? Um, of course, patient populations are always interested in in the financial impact of new treatments. And uh, do you think you know this will be cost effective or will be adopted easily by insurance companies? That's an excellent question. Also, uh, we're trying to. Uh, grapple with that right now. Um, our hope is with uh, a number of different kinds of cancer, the uh, ability to, to avoid a second surgery will pay for itself. For example, uh, roughly a third of all breast cancers recur right at the site of the initial lumpectomy. And it's because there were positive margins left behind, there was malignant tissue left behind, with our tumor targeted fluorescent dye, you could go in and shave until all the fluorescence was gone. That would minimize the amount of healthy breast tissue that would have to be removed and also reduce the number of second surgeries because you could uh, make sure you removed all the malignant disease tissue. And uh, so that those second, you know, if, uh, those second surgeries cost a lot of money. Uh, right. Uh, I think all the the so in terms of, you know, unfortunately, I, like you point out, you have to be realistic and somewhat crass in this. You have to ask a lot of, um, of insurance companies may not pay unless it saves some money. It does save money in the operating room. That we've found that yeah. it's important surgeries because the surgeon finds the disease tissue much quicker and easier. So you can save OR time and at, a, at a $100 a minute in an operating room, that can just I don't think the cost is going to be very high, but I think you're right. You have to still probably justify this by how it will save money rather than perhaps. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so now as you're entering a phase three trial, uh, what, uh, I mean, you probably can't predict, predict this exactly, but when do you expect this to be available and, I mean, FDA approved and available and, and in use in many cancer centers? Well, um, we, uh, I can't predict that exactly, uh, uh, but our <laughs> anticipation is that certainly within a year we'll be done with phase three. It's, it's a very quick trial. The enrollment is not, not difficult. A lot of people want to join the trial. I don't see any downside and there's just upside on it. Uh, yeah, because there's not a, really any significant toxicity. And then after we're finished, it take, it'll take a little bit to collect all the data together and to um, organize it in a way that can be presented to the FDA. Because we have the fast track status, they will be uh, installments of data as we provide them. We don't have to have a finished product of the whole package um, uh, right at the beginning as we as we are able to organize one set of data, we can submit it. So I, I would hope that um, by you know a year and a half from now or so, maybe we're pretty close. Okay. Well, we are eager to hear more about it and looking forward to seeing those results. Um, so we've run out of time for questions. Um, but if folks have more questions, uh, you may be able to call our helpline and maybe somebody there can help. Um, and I mean, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Lau, for taking the time to present with us um, and for the work that you're doing. Really um, interesting and amazing uh, stuff. Um, thank you so much for this informative program. And thank you to everybody who su submitted and everybody who um, I mean participated and submitted questions. Um, if you could please take out a moment to fill out the survey at the end of the webinar, it may take a minute for it to load, but that really helps us uh, be able to bring you um, the programming that you, the educational programming that you want. Um, alrighty, thank you, Dr. Lau. You're very welcome. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.